Although Watson is known as the founder of behaviorism, B.F. Skinner is the most famous behaviorist. So let's take a look at his work now. Burris Frederick Skinner was an American psychologist who is best known for his operant conditioning studies. He first encountered behaviorism when he read John Watson's work. And then when he got into graduate school, he decided to study psychology and come up with his own form of behaviorism. He became popular in part because he was really good at recruiting graduate students to come and work with him and then really good at getting their studies and his studies published, which helped them get jobs after graduate school and spread Skinner's behaviorist ideas to other universities and even more students. In that way, Skinner is similar to Wilhelm Wundt. He, remember, supervised 186 dissertations, which meant that 186 people went out into the psychology departments in the late 1800s and early 1900s and spread these early ideas of wants. The same thing happened with Skinner. He was a likable guy. His graduate students wanted to work with him. They published a lot. This helped spread his ideas. Eventually, his work overshadowed the other neo-behaviorists like Hull and Tolman. He became so famous that in 2002, the APA, the American Psychological Association, named Skinner the most influential psychologist of the 20th century. Not just the most famous, but the most influential, the person who influenced the field, the subfields. Eventually, Skinner's work overshadowed the other neo-behaviorists like Hull and Tolman. Skinner became so prominent in the field of psychology in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s that the APA named him the most influential psychologist of the entire 20th century. They gave out this award in 2002, which is a big deal. Of all of the people that we talk about this semester, Skinner was labeled the most influential. Not the most popular, not the most famous, but the most influential psychologist in the entire century. That's impressive. Skinner was born in Pennsylvania to extremely hardworking parents who, like many of our parents, used rewards and punishments to shape his behavior. From an early age, he said his parents taught him to fear three things, fear God, fear the police, and fear what other people will think of you. And what he meant by this, he didn't mean be afraid of all these different things, but his parents wanted him to obey the rules of society, to contribute to his community instead of B.F. Skinner was born in Pennsylvania to extremely hardworking parents who, like many of our parents, used rewards and punishment to shape his behavior. As a child, he spent a lot of time building things. He made slingshots and model airplanes, and he built this device that allowed him to throw potatoes into his neighbor's yards, and he did get in trouble for it. He described himself as an independent thinker and wanted to become a writer. When he graduated from high school, he took some time off to try to get his writing career started. He was unable to write anything of value, became very frustrated, had a minor identity crisis, and decided that writing was probably not the way he wanted to spend the rest of his career. 
So he decided he wanted to go to graduate school and he ended up studying psychology at Harvard University and earned his PhD from there. He went to school there for several years, graduated in 1931, and then ended up staying on after graduation as a researcher until 1936. Then he taught at the University of Minnesota for a few years. He transferred to Indiana University and then came back to Harvard University to finish out the final years of his career. Throughout his lifetime, he published over 20 books and more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles. That is also impressive. That is a lot of information, but that wasn't the only thing he did. He was also very supportive of his students and was able to, again, spread his ideas through his students. While teaching at the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, he published his first book, The Behavior of Organisms in 1938. In his book, he argued that free will is an illusion and that all behaviors are shaped by, conditioned by the environment. Now he's not saying that free will doesn't exist. He was just saying that the idea that we have 100% control over our behaviors, that we decide how we're going to act all of the time, he didn't agree with that. He argued that there are many situations where our life experiences of being rewarded and punished for a specific behavior, those life experiences, the environment itself, impact whether or not someone will behave in a certain way. And among the behaviorists, this was not an unusual idea. Many of them, remember, said the environment has an impact on behavior. Skinner took it to the extreme and basically said, this tendency is so strong, so significant, that there are very few behaviors that are not shaped by the environment. And the idea that we all have control over everything we do is an illusion. It's, it's not really, it's not that simple. There are other things that are playing a role, namely rewards and punishment. Like Clark Hull, Skinner also believed that it was possible to predict human behavior with precise laws. He encouraged other behaviorists and other psychologists to focus on those things that could be measured. He spent a lot of time working with animals, and so it was relatively easy for him to observe the animals and record that behavior but he encouraged other researchers to find new ways of measuring human behavior. He also described his operant conditioning principles, his methods, his procedures in this particular book. He also described the differences between his principles and Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning. He recognized that his studies were related to, similar to, but yet the ideas were very distinct. And so he wanted to, right off the bat, explain to the world how his work was different from Pavlov's work. He used the word operant because he said behavior operates on the environment. Depending on our action, there may be a reward or there may be a punishment that arises in the environment. Skinner distinguished between what he called respondent behaviors and operant behaviors. Respondent behaviors are those like the ones that Pavlov studied. Reflexes that are elicited by a stimulus in the environment. Reflexes and they are instigated, they are drawn out, they are created by something in the environment. These reflexes do not apply, they don't explain all of the things that we do. Instead, he referred to everyday behaviors as operant behaviors. 
includes everything from what time you wake up to the outfit you choose to wear, the food you choose to eat, what time you choose to leave, when you decide to do your homework, what you do at work, everything. All of your behaviors, according to Skinner, are operant behaviors. Your heart beating, your eyes blinking, sweating when you're nervous, those are respondent behaviors. Those are behaviors that you really don't have any choice over. They just happen because of what's going on in your environment. Operant behaviors are those voluntary behaviors that we have more control over and that are more relevant to the study of psychology. Operant behaviors are emitted, not elicited. They're emitted. And they are not a response to the environment. They're just the normal behavior. Skinner paid attention to what happens after that behavior and how those consequences influence future behavior. This distinction is important because his studies really focused on those operant behaviors. When we teach our animals how to do tricks, we are using operant conditioning principles and we are shaping what he called operant behaviors. Now this can be accomplished using two main processes, the process of reinforcement and the process of punishment. I'll describe them in a little bit more detail on the next slide. But the main idea here is that reinforcement encourages future behavior, rewards increase the likelihood that that behavior will occur again. Punishment discourages behavior. Punishers reduce the likelihood that that behavior will be replicated in the future. Reinforcement encourages and punishment discourages. In order to carry out these two processes, he used several different techniques, and I don't have all of them in this lecture. I've got the three main ones here. There are a few other ideas that we just don't have time to cover. I have a lot of information to show you about Skinner. Here are three of the specific techniques with their definitions. Positive reinforcement. The positive stands for the addition of something. Positive means adding something to the situation. Reinforcement, of course, means encouraging behavior. So positive reinforcement is the idea that we add something of value, something the organism wants, like food or praise, after a desirable behavior. The experimenter's response, whether or not we give positive reinforcement, punishment, or no action at all, the experimenter's response, the environment's response is very important in terms of timing. It needs to happen right after the behavior. Sometimes people will return home from work and find that their pet has left a mess it does you no good to discipline your pet at that point. That behavior probably happened minutes ago, hours ago. The animal is not going to understand that that action from minutes ago and the punishment are related. The positive reinforcement, the lack of a response with extinction, punishment all need to happen immediately after the behavior. Skinner labeled the different examples of reinforcement. He labeled them reinforcers, praise, food, attention. Skinner also used a technique known as extinction in order to discourage future behaviors. Extinction is simply a lack of reinforcement, withholding food, praise, and attention, ignoring the behavior in an effort to make it go away. This works with some behaviors, but not all behaviors. When raising children, parents come to realize that you can't fight every battle. You cannot discipline your child for every single thing that they do. You will spend the entire first 18 years of their lives punishing them. So that's not possible. You will have to ignore 
some behaviors in hopes of it going away. This is called extinction. Not reinforcing those behaviors as a way of making it less likely that those undesirable behaviors will occur again. One of the problems, again, is that many of us end up reinforcing the very behaviors that we don't want to happen. We do it accidentally. We don't even realize that there is a reinforcer in the environment. Negative attention is still attention. And so there are situations where bad behavior needs to be punished and then ignored. Positive reinforcement is adding something the organism does want. Punishment is adding something the organism doesn't want, something bad, something that is considered negative. And we use punishment to reduce the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. It is all about reducing the probability that an animal will do something again. So with pets, specifically dogs, when a dog does something that you don't want it to, say it barks or it jumps on someone, sometimes a quick touch or sometimes a verbal signal, no, I use ch -ch -ch all the time to keep my dog from doing things that I don't want her to do. Skinner called the different forms of punishment punishers. Throughout the 1950s, Skinner studied operant conditioning using two species of animals, rats and pigeons. By the 1950s, many people had had it with the maze studies. That was like, that was the main way for behaviorists to conduct their studies, have these rats run through mazes. By the 1950s, people were tired of the rats running through mazes and were looking for other ways of studying behavior. So Skinner filled that void and he filled it with his work with pigeons. He published the results of these studies in a 1957 book called Schedules of Reinforcement. You can see in the image here, Skinner and his pigeons. And this is where they spent most of their lives. Their diets were controlled. The amount of training that they received was controlled. He really did try to document as much as he could and keep track of all of the different variables that would need to be controlled for in his analyses. Standardization was important to Skinner, just as it was to Watson, Pavlov, and the other behaviorists. In order to standardize his own studies, he built what he called the operant chamber. And you can see an illustration of it here. Clark Hull called it the Skinner box. And even today, you will hear most people call it the Skinner box, but Skinner called it the operant chamber. These chambers had lights, speakers, food dispensers, levers for the animals to learn how to push in order to get the food. They had electric grids in order to shock the animals. Every rat experienced the same type of environment, the same light, the same sounds, the same electrical grid, the same size room, all of those variables were controlled with this setup. He would place the animals inside of the chamber and then record their reactions, record their behavior. He used what is called a cumulative recorder to record, document the rate of their response. So he would take notes and watch what the rats would do, write it down. But he also used this recorder to measure the length of time between say a light and then the lever push. Imagine you are one of Skinner's graduate students and you're introducing a new rat into the experimental rotation. When you first put the rat inside the box, it's just gonna explore everything, sniff everything, look at everything. When the rat goes toward the food dispenser, you would want to drop a piece of food. When the rat has its back to the food dispenser or when the rat walks away, you wanna be sure that you don't drop any food. You wanna make sure that you ignore those behaviors. Sometimes uh, the experimenters would shock the animal when it would walk away from the food dispenser. The idea was to just keep rewarding it 
every time it came near the food dispenser. Eventually, the animal would have to touch the lever. Eventually, the animal would have to press the lever. But at first, you just reward the small behaviors like going towards it, looking at it, touching it. This was done only when the light was on. And that, that light was key. He would present the, the stimulus in the environment, the light or a certain sound, and then the conditioning process would start. So the animal learned that not only do they have to do something specific like press a button in order to receive the reward, but they also learned under what circumstances does this hold. When the light wasn't on, no reward was provided. No light, no reward. The animals learned this association. Okay, that was very important to his experiments. Undesirable behaviors, again, were not reinforced using extinction or they were sometimes punished. After many, 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 many trials, the light gained what he called stimulus control over the lever pressing behavior because the rats learned that in order to receive a reward, the light must be on. If the light's not on, I might as well not even push the lever because nothing's going to happen. This shaping process can be used to teach animals, children, adults to do all kinds of things. In a very simple example, you can see here that he taught two pigeons how to play ping pong. Now they're not really playing ping pong, it just looks like it. He taught them how to peck at this ball, how to make sure that it stays on the table and goes across the table to the other pigeon on the other side. For us, it looks like ping pong. The birds are simply pecking at a ball the way that he taught them to do it. Although Skinner believed that all of our behaviors are in some way shaped by the rewards and punishments that we've received throughout our lives following these behaviors, he also said that we as humans have responses, have techniques, strategies, if you will, that we use to gain more control over our environment and these consequences. We monitor our behavior. We pay attention to what we're doing and how people are responding. We can change the environment by leaving and going to a different environment. We can redirect our attention pay attention to something else in the environment. If we aren't receiving the type of reinforcement that we're looking for, we might need to pay attention to a different source of reinforcement. Telling other people about our goals for the future increases the likelihood that those goals will come to fruition. It puts a good kind of pressure on us to live up to those, those goals. So again, to recap, Skinner believed that our behaviors are shaped by the environment, but he also said that we have ways of gaining back some of that control and making decisions about what we do. Skinner had high hopes for behaviorism. Ideally, he wanted to create a technology of behavior in order to predict and control behavior based on his reinforcement principles. To fulfill his vision, he attempted to apply his operant conditioning principles to everyday problems. Project Pigeon is an example of one of those attempts. He taught a group of pigeons how to guide missiles. These pigeons were going to make a one-way trip on these missiles, the pigeons actually set inside of the missiles. They were strapped in and they would peck on a screen. When they pecked on the screen, it would steer the, the missiles. He successfully completed the project. The pigeons did exactly what they were supposed to do, but unfortunately they were never used. The war ended before it was able to be implemented. Nonetheless, he successfully taught pigeons how to guide missiles. And you can kind of see the setup in the image on your screen. Skinner's ideas contributed to the development of behavior modification, a very popular form of therapy where the focus is on changing the reinforcers of a specific behavior. An undesirable behavior is modified, is changed 
by adjusting the reinforcers, the consequences of that behavior. Behavior modification has been used successfully to help treat millions of people of all ages, people who have been diagnosed with mental illness and everyday people who do not have a diagnosis. One form of behavior modification is called the token economy. Using this technique, people are rewarded for desirable behaviors with tokens, some type of object that people can then trade in for things that they want. This technique has also been used in a variety of different industries. Some of you might remember the reading competitions from elementary school. The more books you read, the more tokens, the more credits you accumulated. And at the end of the year, you might be able to turn in those minutes, those credits for some type of reward. When I was a kid, the reward was tickets to Raging Rivers or to a St. Louis Cardinals game. Throughout his life, Skinner created and designed several different products that applied operant conditioning principles. He created one of the very first teaching machines for children. The machine that you see here on your left was designed to help children learn how to do basic math and how to help them read. The machine would present words and bits of information. The children would have to respond. They would receive immediate feedback from the machine in terms of right or wrong. The machine could also be adjusted to each child. So children who were doing really well could be challenged and children who needed extra help could go back and review the lesson. In 1944, during World War II, he and his wife were expecting their second child. He wanted to create a crib that would keep the baby safe. So he created what he called an air crib. And you can see an example of it here in the image on the right. The temperature was controlled, the size was controlled, there were walls and doors, the baby couldn't get out. Um, as you can imagine, some parents were not okay with enclosing their children in a cage, and so his air crib did not sell very well, but it was another example of Skinner attempting to apply his principles to real world problems. There is one more thing that I'd like to mention about Skinner and his legacy. Although he really didn't make a profit on his trained animals, his work certainly inspired many other researchers, psychologists, and entrepreneurs to figure out a way to make money from the training of animals. This entire industry really owes its success to, to Skinner.